This is Phil, as uh, you, many of you probably know. Um, he's been involved with lots of cool stuff in GNOME and static analysis and handles, uh, handles um, Coverity for all sorts of projects and is generally a guy who loves Jenkins and he's going to tell us all about it. Um, so, yeah, Jenkins, I, I don't quite love Jenkins, but it's, it's been useful. Um, so I'm going to talk about some stuff I've been doing over the last year or so um, in my own time about running Coverity on various GNOME and free desktop modules using jenkins.freedesktop.org, which is a setup of Jenkins which appeared a year and a half ago or so and is available for anyone to use for whatever they like free desktop related. It's just not been very well publicized so far. Um, so I'll do the sort of manager introduction to static analysis. Hopefully, a lot of you know what it is already. Um, I mean, it, it's a subject that covers a lot of things, but basically, you can boil it down to uh, compile time as opposed to runtime testing of all possible code paths in a piece of software. Um, traditionally, it's associated with long running, very computationally intensive uh, analyses, which look at lots of properties of lots of code paths and take a very long time to run. Um, but technically, it doesn't have to be that. I mean, compilers do do some amount of static analysis during compilation to find dead code or other such things. Um, but in the context of this presentation, static analysis is going to be stuff which takes a long time, which you run separately from compilation, which you don't run at, at runtime. Um, by comparison, you've also got dynamic analysis, which is unit testing or other things where you run code to find properties of it. Um, so, Coverity Scan is um, a tool provided by Coverity, who are a company who were spin off from Stanford a while ago and are now owned by Synopsys. Um, it's one of many tools they provide. Uh, it's the only one, as far as I know, that's aware for, uh, that's available for open source projects to use. Um, it's free for open source projects to use, but the software itself is proprietary. Um, and if you are a big company and you want to test your proprietary software with Coverity Scan, it will cost you an awful lot of money. So it's kind of a very valuable service that they've made available for open source projects to use, which is pretty cool of them. And lots of projects do use it. Um, it's composed of a tool that you run on your code locally, uh, which is basically a wrapper around your compilation process, which interposes itself on GCC. Um, and so you, you basically run like cov build space make, and it compiles things. Um, that produces a file, which you then upload to their web service, which is what does the analysis. Um, not entirely sure what's in the file, but I think it's basically statistical information about all the code paths and the code and what the chances are of each path being taken and what happens on the paths. Um, so it's the web service that does the analysis and provides you with the results. Here's a picture of it. Um, this is the overview of what I can see of various GNOME modules. Um, we've got some stats like the defect density, uh, which you're sort of aiming for about 0.1. Um, it's a measure of number of defects per X lines of code. Uh, the number of outstanding defects, which is higher for some modules than for others. Um, and yeah, various different links and things. Um, and this is a screenshot of the actual analysis view that you get. So this is the analysis for GDK PixBuff for a particular bug, which I've specifically chosen because it's in unit tests, so nobody's getting a CV out of this. Um, but it, it shows you the code, and it shows you each branch point um, where it took a particular path through the code, and then it tells you what's going wrong or what's potentially going wrong. In this case, I think this one is a false positive because further up in the code, source width is made, it's, it's checked against being greater than zero. Um, which brings up another point about false positives. Um, which I will go into in a bit more detail later. And also, I think the internet should be working for me, so I should be able to give a more of a, an in-depth demo of this um, later on in the presentation. So I basically just included that slide just in case everything went wrong. Um, 
so is it the best tool for the job is a question that I asked myself when I started setting this up. Um, the answer is yes, but also what job are you trying to do? Um, it's a very powerful tool for doing static analysis for C code. It also supports other languages, but I only really care about C at the moment. Um, specifically, it's got really good support for triaging and dismissing false positives, which is a problem that comes up a lot in static analysis where it finds what it thinks is a bug, but actually somewhere else in the code you can prove because you're a human and you know, you know how the code works that actually that case is never ever going to be reached, in which case the report that it's produced is useless to you and just noise. Um, Coverity aims for a false positive rate of 10% um, through various things which you can do. You can provide extra information to it. Um, Generally, I think we have a slightly higher false positive rate because we don't do all of those things because they take effort. But yeah, it's got really good support for triaging these false positives where you can look through the code and say, no, this is definitely not a bug. Here are the reasons. I'm going to type a comment about it and explain it for people, people to look at in the future. And then you dismiss it. And next time you run a scan, that report will never come back. Um, and in the several years I've been using Coverity, I don't think I've ever seen a false positive reappear spuriously. So that's good. That's a common complaint that people have against other static analysis tools. Um, since it's used so much for a lot of proprietary software and for a lot of open source software, it's used over millions, possibly even billions of lines of code. So it's well tested and they can check out new analyses on a lot of lines of code before they roll them out to everyone. So it's, it's got a lot of things going for it from that point of view. Um, as I said, it's free to use for us, but it is proprietary software, so there are ethical considerations there. Um, as it's a web service, and as we're not paying for it, uh, there is rate limiting on the number of submissions you can do for analyses, which means that we can't, for example, submit an analysis for every single potential pull request that you're going to make to a piece of software. So you can't use it as a try server, um, which is kind of a downside. Um, and it means that the approach that I've taken is to run it roughly once a week for each module and to have the results emailed to people. So there is this lag between you pushing a comment which contains some problem and receiving a report that says, that's the problem. Um, the, the, the choice of a week is open to discussion, but it's kind of a trade-off between getting too many emails, overloading their free service, and getting prompt reports on problems that have been introduced to Git. Um, as I said, the question is, what is the job that you're trying to achieve? Code quality is generally the job you're trying to achieve, the, the goal you're reaching. Um, and that's not a very well-defined question to ask. So I think the approach to take is to use many static analysis tools, of which Coverity is one and possibly one of the best, but there are others. So they're all going to take different approaches, do different analyses, have different ways of reporting false positives and squashing them. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's one tool out of several that you can use. Another prominent one being Clang, Clang Analyzer, um, which is provided by LLVM, um, and which also does a good job of analyzing C code. So, yeah, for the last year, we've been using Coverity, using Jenkins on free desktop. Um, and within each Jenkins job, we've got one per module. Um, each module uses JHBuild to be built and to build all its dependencies from Git, so it's all the latest stuff. And then it runs the analysis within Jenkins and submits the results automatically to the Coverity web service, which then emails the module maintainers and me with the results. Um, and hopefully, one of us then goes and fixes whatever problems get come up. Um, at the moment, the number of modules that are in it, they're sort of fairly limited. It's sort of a set of more security critical modules that have been handpicked uh, partially because um, you need the maintainer to be able to submit a module because Coverity won't let some random person on the internet say, yes, I've contributed to libxml. I would like to see all of the scan results for that, which include lots of CVEs. 
Um, so you need to be a maintainer or a contributor to a module to submit it to Coverity, which means that I can't submit all the modules myself because I haven't contributed to everything. Um, so it's a limited set of modules and concentrating on the ones that have file passes or network interactions or things that are generally considered more security critical or uh, open to exploitation than other things. Um, but this set of modules can be in increased and hopefully as a result of this talk, some people might talk to me about that. Um, the ownership of the scanning by the maintainers of modules varies. So there are some people who have been very engaged in the process and some people who have been fairly hands off and have just sort of let me do the in initial registration with Coverity and then let me take it from there and they've not really paid any attention since, which is fine. Um, particularly, I'd like to thank Richard Hughes, Tobias Muller, uh, Bastian Nacera, and Tim Bader, because they've all engaged quite a lot in this and have been really helpful and provide feedback. Um, and hopefully it's, it's done some good for their modules, but I'll let them speak for that. Um, the administration side of things with setting up Jenkins and running that, is still just me. So some co-maintainership on that would be nice. And I've got some ideas for how to improve it to make that easier, um, which I will discuss later on or afterwards with people. So there's the inevitable XKCD. Um, that's because I couldn't be bothered to put the graphs in the talk. So we can look at the graphs on the web browser. Um, this is the, the main Coverity page. This is the overview page that I showed before. Um, and here are some graphs. So these are the results for glib, um, which has been scanned for quite a long time. Uh, the set of results at the moment is from Git from a few days ago. Um, it gives you various overview things there. So glib hasn't had many changes recently, so no new defects and no defects eliminated. Um, 474 total defects at the moment, 89 dismissed, so those are the false positives, so that's a false positive rate of like one-fifth or something, um, and 225 fixed. That includes things which are like high priority actual bugs which cause crashes, things which are lower priority actual bugs in error handling that are realistically never going to get found, or if they, if they are hit at runtime, you're probably hosed anyway. Um, and other problems which are sort of more code style than anything else where um, the, the way you've written your C code is not something that the static analysis tool is particularly amenable to, so we've rewritten the C code because it's actually clearer to rewrite it anyway because um, it's just easier to understand. Um, you can split things up per component, so we've sort of split out the tests, for example, um, split out glib and GIO just to see what the stats are separately for those. Um, and then it gives you some overviews and probably the most important two graphs of these showing you the number of outstanding defects and the number of fixed defects over time. Um, and each one of these points is a scan submission. So you can see it's been happening fairly regularly until uh, June or July when things broke, which I'll uh, explain in a bit. Um, you can see there's a couple of jumps here, like in January, the number of outstanding defects jumped by about 120, 150. Um, generally, that happens when they release a new version of Coverity with new metrics in and new scans, and suddenly it finds a whole lot more bugs that it wasn't finding before, which is a good thing, unless you're the module maintainer, in which case you cry for a bit. Um, you can see the defect density over time is uh, the number of defects per line per x lines of code, um, and that's just in the last few months dipped below the average for modules which are around the same size as glib. Um, it splits things up by category as well, so you've got like resource leaks or illegal memory accesses, um, various other things which are less interesting. Uh, what else have we got? We've got FWUPD, which Richard has been working on. Um, and I was including this just to show an example of a module where it's a lot more attention has been paid to fixing the, the defects. So you can see that the, the number of outstanding defects has dipped to zero at various points and is normally below six. Um, 
recently it's gone up a bit because the results have not been coming in, and that's my fault, not Richard's. Um, but this, this raises the point that when you first start scanning a module, you're going to get tens or hundreds of reports, and you need to triage all of those to begin with so that you can then start looking past the noise and see the actual new results that are coming in. Um, which means that when you first introduce a module into Coverity, you have a lot of pain, and this is kind of a, a big stumbling block for everyone, um, and something that is, is one of the reasons that the number of modules being scanned at the moment is quite small. Um, so I don't really have a good answer for that. It's, it's something you can work through by introducing modeling files in Coverity, which I can talk about to people afterwards, and using some of their other approaches for reducing false positives, but generally you're going to have to take the hit and do a lot of triaging. Um, hopefully, Richard can attest to the fact that once that's over, it becomes a lot easier to just deal with the one or two reports every month that come in as they come in and handle it that way and sort of um, just keep ticking over. And GDK PixBuff is another thing that's been worked on a lot recently. Uh, Bastian and Toby have been working on this. Uh, you can see the number of outstanding defects has dropped a lot around February when people suddenly realized that it was full of holes. Um, I don't think I have anything more to say about that one other than that's a good graph. That's nice to see. <laughs> um, I'll show that one later. Sort of, um, it's it's hard to give concrete statistics on how many of the reports are false positives and how many of them are true positives. Um, so I'm going to rely on more anecdotal things, like this one that uh, Tim sent me, which was a bug that Coverity pointed out in GTK that he thinks would not have been found otherwise or would have taken a couple of days of debugging once someone actually found the symptoms of it, um, where I think Coverity pointed out that there was a dead branch here because it was checking buffer age greater than or equal to 2 and then checking that it was greater than or equal to 3, which you're never going to reach. Um, so that fixed a bug that people had presumably been hitting, maybe they hadn't noticed, but it was a bug and it was th there were definitely side effects of this. Um, and it was fairly trivial to find in Coverity compared to rooting out the cause of some weird GL problem. I can't claim to know exactly what the symptoms would be because I'm not a GTK person. But that's, that's one little example of the, the good things that it can do. Um, so yeah, I think I've covered most of this. It's particularly good at finding bugs and parsers and network code and file loaders. Um, as with that example, it can find bugs before they hit at runtime. So when you're fixing bugs as a result of seeing them in Coverity, you might not know what the impact would be. You can sort of guess that, yeah, this is definitely bad, or no, this is probably just in an error path. It's, it's not going to be hit by many people. Um, but you don't get the satisfaction of going like, yeah, this is a bug report. This is a crash that's been hit by a couple of thousand people, and I fixed it. It's good. You don't get that feeling. It's kind of hollow. But um, overall, it's probably a good way of fixing bugs before people hit them, which I think is good thing. Um, coupling it to Jenkins means that the previous approach people, some people were taking of running static analysis once every release or whatever on their module is not going to get forgotten, um, which I regularly had the problem of doing before when I was, I would think, yeah, okay, I should run Coverity on my modules before I release, and then release time would come, and I would be in a mad rush, and I would never run it. Um, so having it run once a week solves that problem. As I said, there are some reasons where it's not good. Uh, it's not reasonable to use it as a try server, which means that we, we have to fix the, the issues after they've hit Git. Um, there's a problem with the initial dump of false positives when you add a project. Um, as I said, a lot of false positives are caused by idiomatic C code, which is actually correct, but which the analyzer just can't analyze because it's, it, makes, it in encodes too many assumptions about runtime, which um, too complicated to work out in a static analysis. Um, and the combination of Jenkins and JHBuild is not the most reliable. Um, I think it's probably still the right way to be doing this. But since 
Meson was introduced in all of the lower level modules in the stack, uh, it's kind of broken for a lot of things because the Jenkins environment can't support Meson properly because it's too old, and so all the dependencies break, and we haven't actually submitted any Coverity scans for a while. But I have plans for fixing this, which includes um, a new pipeline for building images, which you can then start doing the compilation on. Um, so if anyone knows about Jenkins Job Builder or Jenkins Pipelines, please talk to me, because I'm currently mired and groovy. Um, and that goes back to the whole co-maintainership co thing. Of it would be good if some other people were helping maintain this, and then we have more build sheriffs, I guess, or analysis sheriffs, to um, deal with problems with this when they come up. So, yes. Um, currently, the set of modules is fairly small. You'll know if your modules are in there. If they're not, and you want your modules to get included and analyses to be submitted for you to deal with, please talk to me. It's not hard to set up once I've actually got Jenkins working again. Um, or you can use Coverity yourself. I mean, you don't have to use Jenkins. You don't have to be tied into this infrastructure. You can just submit the scans yourself. It's freely available to download, although it is proprietary. Um, or you can use other static analysis tools in your free time and just experiment with the results. Um, Clang Analyzer is another good one, but there are other linting tools or whatever that you can run on your code, which have their own advantages and disadvantages. And there are some links. If anyone has any questions, now is a good time. Um, is there any, is there anything magic about the build time other than instrumenting it with the Coverity thingy? Um, I'm just kind of thinking, is it possible to use GNOME Continuous or another thing that builds GNOME all the time to also do the Coverity trace generation? There is nothing magic about it. You need to download their tool and have that available somewhere in your path. Um, it's, a, a, it's a tarball, you extract it, it's not hard. Um, you need to have a submission token for their web service, so you have to have an account there and you have to have the right permissions. Um, and you have to be able to wrap their tool around Make. So it works really well with Make. It probably works well with Mason, but I haven't tried it. Um, yeah, so someone says it does. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a fairly streamlined process. Um, the reason I didn't go with Gnome Continuous was because it doesn't really support building in multiple parallel pipelines. Like, you build with Continuous, and your end result is an OS tree image. It doesn't have a separate pipeline for, oh, also build with Coverity, and then throw the results away. Um, so that's why I didn't do it with Continuous. But it, it is also an implementation option. Yeah, I, th I feel that some of this may be in the process of being reimagined currently. So if you can find the right place in build stream to go like, and now do a Coverity thingy, yeah, there this is, might all get a bit easier. There are some very long emails that I need to read. About I, I'm, just go <laughs> I'm just going for the talk. <laughs> and that. So I'm curious about the the way that it that it actually verifies that you are the owner of a, or involved in a code because couldn't I just if I want to you know if I'm a bad guy and I want to statically analyze an analyze any module hmm. couldn't I just download it rename it to foo and submit it as a new module that I own and get the exact same set of results? Um. I don't know how they deal with that attack pattern, but uh, when you register a new project with Coverity, you say, I am the maintainer or I am the contributor, um, and you give them a URI that's supposed to prove that you are one of those. So it would be like a, a CGIT comet that shows that you've pushed something to that module, and so you have comet rights. And so you, like, if you've got comet rights, you can trivially take over the module anyway. Um, so. They do manually verify them because there's like a one or two day delay after you submit the module before you can actually look at the results. Um, I presume they have some way of checking that you're not just submitting the scans for some other module to something else that you do own. Um, but I haven't actually tried that, so I don't know. But it seems like they've thought about this. Um, what kind of bug have, have you found so far? Like there was an example uh, for uh, GTK, but uh, have you seen any like serious security bug, anything that would have been a serious problem? Um, I mean, there is a school of thought that every bug is a security bug. I haven't actually put any effort into thinking like, oh, how could I exploit this when I'm fixing them? Um, 
the ones in GDK Pix buff were you could definitely get denial of service attacks out of those by allocating five billion gigabytes of memory um, or other things. Um, most of the bugs that have been found after we've gone over the initial sort of triage everything stage have been memory leaks or unreachable code um, or unreachable branches which point out that there's something else wrong with the code, like some missing functionality. Um, memory leaks are quite high up on the list actually, I think. So have, have you compared it uh, the results from Coverity with results from Clang Analyzer, and is there something that Coverity is better at or Clang Analyzer is better um, at? I haven't done that numerically. I think that would be a very hard comparison to do. Um, thinking about it from my experience with using them separately, I think Coverity definitely has a lot more analyses that it covers. Um, Clang generally only looks at very simple things like uh, swapping the arguments on memset, for example. Um, it does have analysis for leaked memory and double freeze and that kind of thing, um, but Coverity also has that. And yeah, I've never compared them like for like for that, so that would be interesting to do, but my gut feeling would be that Coverity would come out on top. Okay, and how about instrumenting it with like ASAN and UBSAN? Um, those are runtime analyses, so they're going to give you different results. Right, but I mean, if you run your test suite under one of those, are you yeah. going to find a lot of things that Coverity would also find, or um, are you going to find very different things? Again, hard to tell. Um, I think they would be better at finding memory leaks on the paths that are taken. Um, obviously, they can't find leaks on the paths that aren't taken or undefined behavior or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think they do a very good job of the run instrumentation at uh, dynamic time uh, uh, when you're doing dynamic analysis. Um, but yeah, again, this comes back to the point of you need to try all of these things to make sure that you've caught all of the bugs. Um, there's there's yeah, no so like, superset. You should run your tests with ASAN and UBSAN and MSAN and all of this. You really should do that. And the uh, what I did just for the fun of it was build flat packs with ASAN and UBSAN and all. And there's so much low hanging fruit out there because, because they just, many apps just explode when you start them with ASAN or, or UBSAN. And um, I figured that some issues that they found, like ASAN and UBSAN, were also found by Coverity. Like the overlap is not very big, but there are there is an overlap of these issues that they find, but you should still run your test, please, with ASAN and UBSAN. I can't stress that enough. You do need to do that. Uh, as a bit of an advertising piece, uh, if your project is built with Mesen, then Mesen ships with a scan build target by default. So it detects that if you have scan build on the system, it creates a scan build target. And in any build directory, you just say ninja scan build, and it will do the whole pipeline for you. That's good to know. That will help me when I'm reworking the Jenkins stuff. Thanks. Sorry, there's less of a question, more of a tip. Um, I've been running Coverity and a couple of projects for a while, and integrating with Jenkins and anything is always a bit, oh, it's a, just a small project. Um, what I've set up to make sure I run Coverity often enough, I just have a calendar reminder to remind me on the second day of a month, run Coverity. And then on that day, it's like, oh, yeah, I've got the email in my inbox. I just submit the four projects. Mm -hmm. And that way, at least you're guaranteed to run it every month, especially on projects that don't move that fast. That's enough. So if you just have a little side project, that's the easiest way to get started with Coverity and make sure it's actually run re regularly. Yeah, if people want to do that, um, the instructions for doing it are pretty simple, but if you need a hand, let me know. No other questions? Thank you very much, Philip. Cool.